and welcome to the Revenue Insights Podcast. Today, I'm joined by the VP Global Innovation Evangelist at Outreach. I've absolutely butchered that. Mary Shea. <laughs> Mary, it's wonderful to have you on the show. Well, it's great to be here, Lee. And I'm so sorry I created a title that doesn't roll off the tongue as easily as we all would <laughs> like. But anyway, I'm here and I'm looking forward to our chat. Yeah, it's, it's great to have you on. And we were actually just talking about it beforehand, like the title. Um, I, it actually leads me really nicely kind of into the first thing that I want to know. And I guess that's really, you know, what what has your story been so far to get to the point of having such an amazing job title? Wow. So I think it's, you know, I'm sort of deep into my career at this point. And you get to a point in life and professionally where you kind of just want to do what you want to do. And thankfully enough, the last six years that I spent at Forrester being a principal analyst covering the sales technology space put me in a position where I had a a pretty nice professional global brand. And when I was looking for my next opportunity, I decided that this was the title I wanted because innovation is really important to me. And um, when I joined a company, and now it's outreach, obviously, I wanted to bring innovation to every aspect of the go-to-market, whether that was through potential business partners that we could partner with to um, do co-branded thought leadership or partners that we could embed into our technology platform and deliver more value to our users and our customers, or whether it was creating more innovative ways to go to market, like having a conversation like this or, um, you know, doing something different. So innovation was really important to me. And I love to travel. And when I was a CRO, I had global responsibility. So I really wanted to emphasize that I'm supporting not just our North American business here at Outreach, but also our business um, in the UK, which is about 10% of our business. And um, I wanted everyone to feel very supported that this was going to be a global role that was going to help them and their customers and prospects, um, you know, succeed and do exciting things in their day-to-day job. So, I mean, that was kind of the uh, the derivative. And then, of course, Guy, Guy Kawasaki was the first evangelist I think we had in the tech space with Apple. And so I had to have the evangelist word in there. Sometimes I feel like I should have just gone with chief evangelist and that would have been easier. But I don't know. This is more interesting. It's definitely more interesting. It's a lot harder to say, but uh, it's definitely more interesting. And I'm sorry about that. (laughs) That's all good. Um, And I've been doing loads of like reading up, and and you're obviously, as you mentioned, like super, uh, like really prominent in the space, doing a lot of like thought leadership. And something that, um, from from my perspective, and I know you've talked a lot about like the multi generational shifts that are happening at the minute. From throughout your career, how how has the sales process changed and kind of how have you seen it develop to the point where it is today? Well, I mean, I started my sales career back in the mid to late 90s and I was actually an SDR, so front of the cycle rep uh, for Forrester. I did two stints at Forrester, one um, in sales and then coming back many, many years later after I'd made a name for myself as an analyst. And so, you know, you can't even compare what it was like when I was an SDR, we would be, you know, our phone calls were tracked, our emails were tracked, the, you know, everything was fairly rudimentary. Uh, we rolled our, our CRM system, it was Siebel, which I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, but not the easiest system in the world to use. <laughs> and, um, you know, selling, I think the biggest change was at that point, selling was more of an art than a science, right? Um, because you didn't have the technological advancements that we've had in sales tech from circa 2015 to where we are today. So there definitely was more of that, I want to say, brawn rather than brains and art rather than science. And now I feel like that is really flipped on its head, right? So now it's the the sellers and the leaders and managers are going to be really successful are the ones that um, can lean into the science a little bit more. Who maybe aren't going to use, you know, this. Let's let let let's hit everyone in the whole universe, but a more targeted approach with, you know, understanding buyer intent with a tool like Sixth Sense and figuring out who's, you know, where the buyer is in the journey and what kind of insights that they're looking for, and then really deliver a very targeted conversation at the right moment. So, I would say, we've really shifted from brawn to brains and art to science, but in sales, you know, sort of having that grit 
and fortitude never goes away. And the art of, um, you know, reading a room, whether that's a digital room like we're in today or a hybrid room where I think most of us will engage or one-to-one in person, Um, being able to be a great listener and empathetically understand your customer prospects, challenges, and problems. And to be that advisor, be that person who really has their back. Um, I think, I think that's, you know, will never go away. Something that I'm really intrigued by, and actually to, to pick out a specific word that you said there, where, you know, you said that we've, we've shifted from an art into a science. And I want to focus on that word shifted. So do you think that we're, do you think that, you know, sales teams are there now? Or do you think it's still like a, a, a slow burn to becoming data-driven? I think it's a slow burn. Um, I mean, I don't think we have anything to thank COVID for, but I think there's some innovations that came out of being part of a global pandemic. As early as 2017, I was following the data that said buyers increasingly wanted to meet on virtual platforms or remotely versus in person. One in seven buyers actually said that. And it was kind of a, people weren't really picking up on it. When COVID hit, 80% of buyer, of sellers said, I can't be successful if I can't go meet my customer in person. And now look what happened. You know, people closed multi-million dollar deals and they never met because they couldn't. So, you know, I, I think, I think it's going to be a mix of both. You know, like I was saying before, the art never goes away. But you do need to start to lean into the science. And I think sellers who understand that and embrace it will be the ones who succeed. And the ones who don't um, will probably fall off by the wayside and, you know, die in the vine there. Mm. And and do you think that it will, um, and, and I'm coming at this from a marketing perspective, right, where we've, marketing has gone on this journey to becoming super data driven. And what's really interesting yeah. now is it's now starting to go back to be like, actually, we need to be more creative. And so, you know, we've had this real shift in in sales in particular to being more like, you know, data driven. But do you think that over time we're going to go mad for data and then go, actually, we need to go back to basics? That's such a great question. And, you know, like when you think about business and life, it's all about moderation, right? It can be all or nothing. Um, what's interesting about your observations on marketing is that I'm seeing it too, especially with some of our events. Like we are uh, curating three events this this fall. I'm leading one, which is a women in revenue or uh, revenue event. And we're having it at Napa. We're doing another one for chief revenue officers and one in uh, London that you'll hear about soon. And we're really building in a lot of time for... Um, you know, sort of getting refreshed, um, having more intentional networking, um, bringing in speakers like Brene Brown or, um, uh, you know, others who can really help us just take a step back and realize we're, you know, we've been through three years of a pandemic. Now we're in a global economic downturn or on the cusp of that. It's been a tough environment. So we're seeing... um, a lot more desire from for just sort of taking a pause and having a little bit of a personal connection. And I think we're seeing that in marketing. We're seeing different types of events where the standard webinar has gone by the wayside. You see podcasts like these are much more exciting and interesting. Um, and then you see more interactive types of engagement. So yeah, I mean, it can't be all or nothing in what we do. It has to be, you know, a blend and then you're going to have ebbs and flows in different periods in the continuum based on what's going on in the world. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, something that I'm quite interested in, you know, particularly in your role, which, you know, really does look at everything from a global perspective. I'm quite interested in your opinion on, do you think that, I guess, the ma- maturity of that digital transformation, do you think that that certain, you know, you know, you're obviously based over in the US, I'm based over in the UK. Do you think that, you know, the US is kind of leading? Um, compared to other regions? Or do you think actually a lot of the other regions are catching up? I think the U.S. is leading with technology adoption and technology innovation in the sales tech space for sure. Um, And you could see this even with CRM where, you know, adoption of CRM and utilization of CRM was a bit slower over in the U.K. and EMEA regions. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I I, I think that... um, 
In terms of where we are globally with the digital sales transformation, I still think we're very much in the early innings, Lee. Um, even in over in the states here, stateside, you know that those those um, folks that have aggressively and assertively embrace digital sales transformation, whether you know they're sales tech or SaaS or Amazon or Microsoft or whoever, um, were an amazingly good position when COVID hit. And they could pivot and be very agile and move forward and have uh, virtual events. And, you know, they were ready. The organizations that hadn't made that investment were really in a tough spot. And I was at Forrester at the time. And I had never been busier as an analyst where you have traditional companies, whether that's commercial real estate or um, med tech or... Um, you know, I want to think of uh, industrial manufacturing being like, you know, our sales tax stacks a mess and, you know, we don't have any of the right stuff and we're not set up to be able to engage in this. But then should we sit by the sidelines and wait for everything to go back to normal? And a lot of the coaching I did at that time was, you know, there is no normal. It's just the next thing. Um, and tech is here to stay and your buyers are changed exponentially. So you've got to make this investment. But I think we're in early days, but I do think I'm spending less time convincing um, executives to make that change and more time helping them think through how do I execute? You know, how do I how do I take a look at my sales tech stack? How do I get rid of the duplicative solutions? Where are the big foundational gaps? And what's all this stuff about the platform? And and what is even going to happen to CRM? So I think we're in a place where everyone knows the world has changed and is changing and will be volatile for the foreseeable future, and that tech is going to play a really important role in bringing buyers and sellers together and driving massive efficiencies for organizations, which I think will be increasingly important um, as we deal with these financial headwinds. Mm, Definitely. Could could you elaborate a little more on a, a bit of something that you said there around what you've kind of been advising some of those execs on. So I guess what are some of the most common things that you're seeing coming up that it, to you, it's just like, oh my God, it's so obvious, right? Um, but actually for a lot of our listeners as well, it may well not be. Yeah, there's so many different things that seem so obvious, you know, and you do this when you spend all day long thinking about this stuff and talking to people about this stuff, but it's not obvious for everyone. And I think, you know, you still see organizations that are saying, you know, CRM's the answer. And CRM's not the answer for go-to-market. It's a back-end, back-office solution that is important and crucial, and we have to have it. And it's a system of record and hopefully a single source of data truth. But in its early days when it was designed for sellers, like nobody used it because it didn't match their workflows. It didn't have anything to do with their activities and how they went about their day-to-day activities. And then because they didn't use it, then you had all these massive data gaps. And then data gaps, you know, as a marketer, leads to a disruptive, disruptive and disrupted in a negative way experience with between sellers and buyers, right? So hiccups and all kinds of things that buyers won't stand for anymore. So I still say, I think the biggest thing is executives like making massive financial investments in CRM and expecting sellers to use that. Whereas the innovative companies are um, engaging with uh, providers like Outreach and others that provide a seller first technology that was designed for the sellers. The, the workflows match how the seller works. The UI makes sense for a seller. Um, and then placing those platforms through APIs and uh, integrations on top of that CRM. So I think that's probably the biggest thing. Um, the other, the second thing might be like really thinking that we're going back to where we were, which we're not. Yeah, definitely. I think that's probably a nice segue to probably talk a little bit about some of the um, some of the studies and reports that I know you, that you've got coming out. Um, I was having a look beforehand where you did a lot about the like closing the sales execution gap and a lot of the change to the sales cycle. I kind of want to open up because I know we were talking a little bit beforehand that you've got quite an exciting study on the way. So what what kind of things are you seeing in terms of how things are shifting um, in, in B2B selling? Yeah, I mean, to ask a, an analyst or researcher about their data, it's like Christmas just came came to my house here. So thank you for asking. Um, 
So I work uh, oftentimes with Forrester as well as with other uh, data providers. And so we have a Forrester study that I think is coming out right when this podcast drops uh, next week. And it's called Generational Shifts Fundamentally Change B2B Buyer and Seller Dynamics. And um, we actually went out and uh, surveyed about a thousand plus buyers across 22 plus industries in the UK and US and Canada. And what I wanted to understand was in the past 24 months, how had the buying cycle changed? How had the buying process changed? And what did these buyers think was a great experience in interacting with their seller? And um, I found so many things I didn't expect to find, which is really cool. Um, many that I did, which is unsurprising. Um, but like the biggest thing is, um, you know, sales cycles are much longer now. Um, over the t- past 24 months, 75% of buyers are saying our cycles are longer. And one of the reasons they're longer is because there's more stakeholders involved in the process. So you can have anywhere, depending on the size of and complexity of your solution, 11 to 22 buyers. And then usually those folks are matched on the sell side because you've got to have you know top to top, mid to mid, different levels of conversations. So you've got a lot to manage um, in terms of this complicated selling process. And then um, more touch points are needed to drive a sale to closure. So digital touch points um, across the entire revenue cycle. So it's getting hard for sellers. In, and I love that. In a nutshell, it just genuinely is getting harder for, for sellers. And I suppose that's what um, is driving uh, a lot of this digital transformation, right? Because of a lot of those changes to to the sales cycle. And so uh, I guess to open this up more more generally, what what do you think are some of the ways to start to to manage that? And, and how do sellers actually start to take that into consideration in their day to day and actually start, you, you know, that number of stakeholders is a lot of relationships that you're maintaining, right? Um, it's, Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, I think the first thing is really understanding the trends and the dynamics between buying and selling. So now we don't have buyers, we have buying groups. We don't have, you know, top down decisions that, you know, the baby boomers used to make, but now we have an inclusive uh, decision that's more consensus oriented and we have much more focus on adoption. So those are some of the things that have changed. And then, You also, this is really interesting, we found that um, buyers value efficiency in the buying cycle and confidence in the seller. So I asked, you know, if if, uh, you ask a complex question of a seller, is your your preference that they are able to answer it right in the moment or, you know, do a follow-on call and bring a subject matter expert? Well, they actually want it answered in the moment. And they don't want to add another two weeks or three weeks to the cycle and bring in so that that expert. So what that means is sellers need to understand, like, we better have our experts right on that call or have access to a sales execution platform like Outreach where you have a conversation intelligence tool like Kaya, which can use natural language processing and surface up all these enablement cards based on the queries and questions that the buyers ask, and you can answer it right there in the moment. So the first step is really educating yourself as a seller and understanding what do they want? What's different from how I've been doing this for the last five years? And how do we need to tune our sales engagement as well as our go-to-market to match this new cohort of buyers of which millennials are the primary drivers. So 93% of millennials are making B2B uh, purchase decisions. 55% of them with their own budgets, 38% with combined budgets. Now, I'm not saying Gen X don't have any influence. They do, but less of an... They have bigger budgets. So Gen Xers have more of like that million dollar plus budget, uh, but maybe not quite as much influence in sort of bringing in a new provider. Um, And boomers of which I'm one, I'm a boomer reboot, Um, their influence is waning um, in the decision-making process. But when I look at go-to-market strategies, most all of them have been designed and tuned for boomers and Xers because they're they're sort of the older, more traditional buyer. So 
you've got to understand how to talk to this new cohort that values and prefers different types of engagement styles. And I, I love a lot of the uh, suggestions that you've made there, particularly around like conversational intelligence. And what I'm wondering with, with that in mind, you know, to, to everyone that's kind of listening, what, what would you say then to, to, you know, to speak to those, you know, millennial buyers? What, I, what is the fundamental um, like tech stack or, you know, selection of tools? Because obviously yeah. we, we, you might be a, 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 a leader at an enterprise size company and then you also might be a leader at like a high growth company. So rather than, you know, we can have everything in the world, you know, perhaps what are the few that yeah. are absolutely fundamental? Yeah, it's such a great question. And I will say um, that the SaaS delivery model and pricing model is kind of a great equalizer because you can be an you can have a tech stack that is very similar to what an enterprise company has. Um, maybe not as deep, right? But because of the consumption model or the pricing model, um, it's accessible. So those some of those barriers have been removed. But I mean, obviously, you have to have CRM at least today, right? Mm-hmm. I think you, um, you 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 need to have some sort of sales intelligence. So you've got to have a sales intelligence provider, um, a way to um, you know continue to enhance uh, your your contact data that's changing on a regular basis. And there's companies out there that can kind of scrape this. I think you absolutely have to have. Uh, some sort of an intent provider, an ABM type of provider, like a Sixth Sense. And you have to have a sales execution platform like Outreach. And you know we're not the only one that does it. But the biggest change from now versus 2015 when I was at Forrester is that all of these solutions were point solutions. And you have to, as a tech sales tech buyer or exec, you'd have to kind of be like your own systems integrator. Today, you can now get a platform um, And what's beautiful about the platform is you only have, um, you know, one provider to negotiate with you, you know, so there's economic savings in terms of the time there. You've got a functionality that can relate to the chief revenue officer, your head of RevOps, down to your first and second line managers, your reps, your post-sale personnel. Everyone uses functionality. And all of the activity data that happens on the sell side and the buy side is automatically captured and stored in single set and uploaded into your CRM. So the great news is now is that you don't have to wonder or worry about all these siloed data from point solutions. You can just get a platform. Um, it sits on top of your CRM. And of course, you're going to amplify it with a few other things like the sales intelligence and all this other stuff. But we integrate with all the companies that I talked about. So we just announced a big integration with Sixth Sense, which now, you know, what that does. So it allows, um, it gives you visibility into all the behavioral activities in the earlier stage of the discovery process, right? So going to a website, downloading some content, going to a webinar, doing all of this. Now Sixth Sense provides all of that visibility and analytics to our sellers right in the platform. So they know now through this native integration, exactly where their buying group is or their individual buyer is in terms of their journey, what they've done prior to even talking to sales. And they can engage with a much deeper level of understanding, which I think is going to be so important going forward. Mm. And and to to lead on from that, and actually, you know, going back to something we talked about earlier in terms of like how it's, you know, shifted. Um do you think it's going to stay like that for the next 18 months where that's the, like the foundational core or do you anticipate that you know that could potentially change? I think this is the foundational core. Um you know if you think about it right now we're first you had CRM then you had like all these different point solutions I call that kind of I call CRM legacy technology sales tech I call these point solutions sort of a period of experimentation, right? Where you're trying to figure out, oh, let me try conversation intelligence. Let me try engagement. Let me see if I can use Seismic and, you know, be able to deliver this content and get rich analytics back. Now, technology buyers don't want to spend all this money and they want integrated data. And so I think the platform is not changing. I think we're right at this period from, you know, we went from from experimentation to 
uh, consolidation, where there's a lot of consolidation with these different providers. Now we are in platformization. And now it's really about helping the market understand you know, where these sales execution platforms sit relative to CRM, how they work together, how they allow you to get more value and extract more value from your CRM. Um, and so I think it's more education and we're at the be- beginning of this phase. I don't see any major major changes because I think we're really early at this um, particular juncture. Amazing. One, one topic I've really wanted to cover um, and, and to take us a little away from the kind of line of question that we've kind of originally been on, I'm a real admirer of uh, how you've kind of championed diversity, equity, and inclusion. But something that I wanted to ask you, and I guess in your own words, is why do you think it is so important? Well, that is a big question. It's important because it's the right thing to do, right? Every member of society should have equal opportunities at wealth creation and doing the types of jobs that uh, give them passion. And we also know that um, diversity of thought and backgrounds and culture contribute to better business outcomes, better business results. So number one, it's the right thing to do. Um, But number two, if you need more proof, there's so many pieces out there that uh, LinkedIn actually did a great piece with Forrester last year that actually looked at organizations that are leaders in bringing diversity, equity, inclusion into their uh, organization and selling organization. Uh, are actually better uh, producers of business outcomes. So they deliver targets better than the laggards. And so the data shows that with a sales team or a company that's reflective of the world around you, you're going to get better business results. So why wouldn't you do it? Hmm. Why do you think that is? I mean, I think ultimately it's about this diversity of thought and experiences. Um, that you're, you know, collaborating and bringing new ideas to the table, and um, different lenses of thinking through things and problem solving. I also think, as you think about specifically in sales and how the sales role has changed over the last twenty years, um, and I don't want to go out on a limb here, but and you know, you know, it's perhaps um, folks who identify as as uh, being women. Um, some of the skills that they intrinsically bring to the process are more aligned with how buyers want to buy today. It's less about, you know, hunting and pitching and closing and driving. And it's more about listening. It's more about collaborating. It's more about bringing the right resources to the table and coaching your buyer around, you know, here's what you need to do internally. First, we need to do this. And now you need to get, um, you know, 10 cup this and being that coach. So I don't want to say that that's, um, those skills are unique to one gender or um, another, but um, maybe folks with different backgrounds that aren't fitting into that traditional mold, it's their moment to be really successful in sales. And for folks that do fit into that traditional mold, it's an opportunity to learn from others that um, maybe had a different journey than you did. Mm. I love that. I want to ask one more question before we kind of move to wrap up, Mary. Um, What what trend, you know, as a as a futurist, I think I I read from one of the articles that you uh, wrote um, in the past. um, What trend do you hope to see most emerge from sales leaders over, you know, the next twelve months or even beyond? Yeah, I think there's a couple. um, You know. Gartner did uh, some research in Q3 of 2021, and they said sales leaders' budgets are increasing, or 70% of sales leaders say their budget's going to increase by 70%. And I believe a lot of that is because of uh, the ability to acquire technology and bring technology into their organizations. I think sales tech is the leg of the stool that's going to help your CROs and your heads of sales bring their sales strategy to life or operationalize it in a more business terminology. So, you know, I think we're going to see sales leaders become more savvy about tech and understand the role it has in successful execution. I think we're going to see sales leaders look to do more with less. 
Um, that's going to be a force fit because of the global economic downturn that we're facing. But this has been in the works for a long time. So you're going to start to see sales leaders think about shifting headcount maybe to tech. Um, they're going to have to reskill and upskill their sellers because the traditional way of selling isn't going to resonate with this buying cohort that we have out there today. So we're going to see more um, upskilling and training. And I hope that we will see eventually um, sales organizations that are very representative of what the world looks like, whether that's from um, how you identify to what your cultural backgrounds are to um, how long you've been walking the earth. We can go on and on forever. Um, And I think ultimately... um, that's what the sales organization of the future is going to look like. It's going to be agile. It's going to be small. It's going to be nimble. It's going to be abled with tech. It's going to look like the world around us. It's going to be collaborative. And it's going to drive massive um, uh, efficiencies in your organization. So you're going to see, instead of that 80-20 rule, where when I was a CRO, it's like, well, I'm just going to focus on the 20 that are going to deliver 80%. Now you're going to see 80, 70, 80, 90% of this small team actually at or above quota. And I think they'll, because of all the insights they're getting um, from the large data sets and machine learning algorithms that can derive those insights, they're going to be highly consultative. Um, so I think it's going to be an amazing field. This is a call to action for any of your listeners who aren't in sales, maybe, um, or ones who are in sales. It's going, the profession is just going to get more and more interesting and exciting over time, albeit, you know, very different from how it was in the last 10 years. I absolutely share. I share that hope as well. Well, Mary, it's been fantastic to have you on. Um, Really interesting conversation. And um, I guess before we kind of finally sign off, um, I want to hand the stage to you, you know, where can uh, where can the audience uh, listen to a little bit more about you? Where where can they find you on socials? Yeah, so I'm super accessible. Um, I have my own podcast called Revenue Innovators Podcast. So if you are one, you sell to one, um, or you want to be one, you should listen and um, reach out to me there. I am on LinkedIn, uh, um, on Twitter uh, at uh, Shay O U T R, and by my outreach email, which is Mary Shay at outreach I O. And um, I love this stuff. I love sales. I love tech. I love um, talking about social equity and a million other things. So don't hesitate to reach out to me if you want to continue the dialogue uh, in a remote setting. Perfect. Mary, thank you so much again. And thank you to everyone listening. I shall see you next week. Cheers.